go ahead and give you the position that they got. Our uh, board meeting, uh, board of Harboring and Cosmetology. Our board meeting of uh, the Harboring and Cosmetology in San Diego on October 24th. So, to open our meeting today, and let's begin with the uh, all the orders of establish a quorum. And uh, Christy, will you? Okay, Steve Weeks? Yes. yes. Kelly Pam. Present. Megan Ellis? Present. 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 I'd just like to welcome uh, the new board members as well. Um, as we come to a close in the 22 session uh, for the year, I just want to say thank you to everybody for what a great time it's been. Although tumultuous at times, um, overcoming quite a few hurdles, um, it's been an honor to be a part of the board and to serve uh, our community and our industry. Um, as my term comes to a close this year, I just want to say thank you again uh, for the opportunity. Thank you for your help throughout this time. And um, I look forward to seeing all the progress that the new members as well as the current members will begin and continue to do uh, for the public as well as the industry. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. Let's move on to item number four, which is approval of the July 25th uh, board meeting minutes. Uh, and I think one of the 
I move to approve. So the, uh, we have a second that? I Yes. Jacob Rosati. Yes. Motion passes. Are, there are boards and bureaus in the department that 
are not as fortunate as us, and so sometimes our budget office will focus more so on them as opposed to a budget like ours that is very healthy. Um, but we will be working to try to get it. Um, it's usually, there's, there's a lot of states that we are not allowed to travel to, and there's been some conventions, conferences this last year that were in those states. Um, so it's been zero more than not. <laughs> I, I was just curious yeah. about budgeting for the future um, and whether or not we could put money in there for potential upcoming conferences or something like that. Um, or if we had to keep it zero, but I appreciate that. And Thank we you. also can always um, request out of state. We there's a process for out of state travel that is like a year in advance, and unfortunately, sometimes things pop up that are not in the year in advance. But um, I can say that so far, this um, this administration has been super um, helpful in getting us approval for those um, those travels. So. We try to plan for it a year in advance, um, but it doesn't doesn't always happen. Hello, um, is there an example of what falls under consultant and professional services external? Because I just noticed that was also pretty high, and I'm just curious as to what falls under there. That is um, our exam contract. That was my question. Oh. Okay, so then on the next page is what is our budget fund condition, and this is what is actually printed in the governor's budget. Um, so this shows our, our actual allocation, our current year, and then our budget year and our budget year plus one. It's a formula that the Department of Finance sets. And then the most important line is the very bottom line that says Munson Reserve you can see that ours are um, very high and then um, incredibly stable. <laughs> um, so that's the good, the good sign right there, as long as those numbers are um, in the plus, on the plus line. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on to our licensing and exam and disciplinary review committee. Um, there's something that is not on here that I wanted to announce. Um, every year we are asked about the languages that we provide our exam in and we are often asked about Chinese. Um, we, I was recently asked again about Chinese um, by a assembly member's office um, and we um, pulled some data and we looked at the amount of people that request a Chinese interpreter to come with them to the, um, to the exam. And it, it doesn't meet that the level of um, requirement that, that we have, which is the 5% of our population. If it met 5%, then it would be required. So obviously, like, Vietnamese is well over 5% of our population. Spanish is well over 5%. And Chinese doesn't meet that. However, it is the highest requested um, interpreter to be brought to the examination. So I met with our exam vendor, who happens to be in the, uh, in the crowd today, Sean. Sean is with um, PSI, who's our exam vendor. And they have agreed to add simplified Chinese to the exam. And so we um, have, Carrie handles our breeze portion of it because there's some technical changes. And we plan to launch that March 1st. I know. It's, we're pretty excited. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. And um, I'm being from San Francisco, um, while it may not be statewide meeting the criteria, clearly there are jurisdictions in the state where it is a very important need. So thank you very much. Yes. We're super excited. And now, I'm, now any, um, the, the legislature who has been inquiring is also extremely happy and Hopefully we make it live March 1st. It has a change in breeze, which is not always a breeze, but we, and we expect it to happen March 1st. But we'll be keeping you updated in future board meetings, but we were super excited to announce that today. Um, okay. Budget implications uh -huh. minimal. 
Yes. All right, so um, going into our report, our licensing unit is almost completely staffed. We just have um, what, um, some vacancies that we're adding that we, we call them limited term. So we're basically, it's gonna come out of that um, separate temp line item because it's not allocated positions, but what we're doing is bringing in additional staff to help with the emails and the phone calls as we've been talking about. We still are experiencing very high um, email um, counts. So um, with the full staff licensing unit, we do anticipate some of our processing times going down. We're running for exams about six weeks to process those applications. Um, and we really like to keep those within 30 days, so hopefully we'll get caught back up in those as well. Um, we have hired a man new manager for our licensing unit, and he actually comes from our licensing unit, so we promoted James Zimmerman. He was currently our, well, he was our um, lead of our licensing unit and has now been promoted to management. So um, that was super exciting. It's nice to have somebody in-house that was um, willing to take on that task. And then we still have an additional licensing manager position that we're recruiting for. Hopefully interviews are going to be held for that in the next couple of weeks. Again, like, as I mentioned, telephones and emails. Um, it's emails mostly that are um, incredibly high, I mean, just incredibly high. I'm, in, I'm shocked at how high they are. Um, last Friday, we had to have another all staff email day just to try to get them within a reasonable range, but we're currently delayed responding to emails um, well over our eight day um, desire. I mean, we've always been able to answer emails within 24 hours and now we're running about 10 days to get responses back. Unfortunately, people aren't hearing those responses, so they're emailing again. Um, and, uh, you know, it's become a situation where we've had to weigh processing applications or answering emails. And so we are constantly balancing that on a regular basis. Is this, the, uh, is this a problem with all boards in California right now? No. Okay. I, I don't believe so. Okay. It's unusual to us because we have so many specific questions regarding our licensing uh, operation. It's, it's just our volume. I just don't think anyone else has any type of volume like we do. Um, the amount of applications coming in is high and um, we have experienced um, a lot of people applying online but not understanding how to or thinking they had attached their proof of training and it didn't get attached. So we actually just held a town hall meeting with schools and any students that wanted to come on and we walked through that process with them at this meeting to see if that would help because what happens is, is we're getting a lot of deficient applications. So we're getting their applications without a proof of training. So that means we have to send a letter to tell the, the student that we didn't get your proof of training. Um, and so then the student emails back the proof of training. So now that goes into the email. And then we get the question, when's my exam? So it's just, oh, we're kind of stuck in a vicious circle. That's why we're bringing on more staff to handle just the emails, and that way our other staff can focus on processing the work so that the two hopefully will meet in the middle and there won't be the questions because they'll already have been processed. Does contractors have a standing um, telephone operation uh, to answer these questions? They have their own call center. With they do their own. How yeah. many other boards have calls? I know that medical board does. I know that... Um, BR, a board registered nursing does, yeah, quite, there's quite a few. Yep. I'm curious if an automated message goes out when people's email has been yes. received. It, it does. does. Is it possible to amend it to let them know about the extended? It is. We actually amend it on a weekly basis and let people know um, what our time frame is in responding. The first thing you see in, in red is you will not get a response within eight days or whatever that number is. And we also provide some very basic information. So a lot of people will email us because they can't get into their Breeze account. And that, it, we can't help them with that. There's actually a Breeze line for that. And so that's in this email. We also have our processing times in the email. So we, we, you'd be surprised at how many people apply 
and then three days later email us and say, Where's my, um, when's my exam? So we put that in the, in the automated response as well. Like if you just applied, you know, you, we won't have an answer for you for at least six weeks or whatever it happens to be. But we change it all the time. This is just my tech brain working, uh, the millennial in me, I guess. So is there a way to filter messages as they come in and like maybe install some sort of software that like reads the email and then creates curated responses? So if it like word tags, like where is my, you know, when can I take a test? It will respond specifically like, you know, thank you so much, blah, 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 blah. Um, Cause I come from a industry that's also very high volume responses and certain places do filter and specific. So that way, if you do have an all hands staff day, you can be like, okay, these can be touched a little bit later, but these have been sorted into emergency. We can email those, you know, daily. We don't have that. Um, we would have to, the department of consumer affairs would be the one who would have to have something like that. I don't know of any state agency that has something like that. I can tell you we manually filter them. Um, so there's that. <laughs> um, we also just set up an additional email box just for proof of trainings because that's, we want to try to get to those quicker. That's an application that has to be processed. So one of the things is we met with all the schools and we've sent them information on if you have a POT to submit separately, send it to this email box. So hopefully those steps will help a little bit, but uh, just this morning I checked, we have over 1,800 emails waiting to be answered to. Um, we sort them by, like we look to see if they've sent their email more than once and then we will clean that up and make sure the most current one is being responded to. Um, but it's all manual. This, I know this board several months ago was very interested in setting up a full and operation. I'm glad you, you're getting that going because I think all of us are want to make sure all these people's concerns are met on a timely basis. I, I, I know we're kind of big fish in the sea on this. I mean, we're in, in, in some cases 10 times larger than some boards in the state. And uh, we're still a couple hundred thousand licensees larger than contractors or nursing even. So we're, we're the big fish in the sea. Yeah. So it's been, when the numbers sit, they're going to strike on us. So right. I think we're all pretty much in agreement that we should continue on with this thing just as, as quickly as possible. Definitely. OK. Um, I, talking about the examinations, um, as we all know, our new examination was um, released on July 1, 2022. Um, we have seen drops in those statistics that we will get to here in just a minute. On the next page is our quarterly applications received. Of course, you're only seeing one quarter since we're in the new fiscal year, so um, it's pretty average right now. And then our next page is our written exam results. So you, all, you will see that our um, exam results have dropped um, in our barbering and cosmetology. They've maintained in our aesthetics and our manicuring and our electrology. Um, in fact, it's in comparing um, some of our current um, exam pass rates, the esthetician has actually um, gone up in some levels. So. Um, we have um, met with PSI, we have met with the Department of Consumer Affairs Office of Professional Examination Services to look at these low pass rates. Um, it's expected to see these low pass rates, however we still um, are concerned and so we, we went and um, I went over a lot of data just last week with PSI. And I also went through a lot of um, schools who have some of the highest failure rate to kind of see if we could tell what was going on. Um, one of the things I found was I looked at um, a couple schools that had the highest number of people that took the Barber exam that failed. And I looked at all of those students' proof of trainings to see what were they doing. Were they doing less hours? Were they doing, um, you know, uh, just what, what could I see? And what I did find that was interesting is the one school that had the highest 
volume of people that failed the test actually had most people had done the 1500 hours so the education that was required before and they were multiple te um, times taking the test so our numbers are low so from an, a regular quarter the number of people that actually took the test is lower than normal so the volumes in previous quarter was much higher so we have to take that into consideration as well. We also, um, I also looked at a school that had a high number of failures for the Barber exam, and I found that um, of, of 18 students that failed, their, failed the test, which was a high number, it's one of the highest numbers in a quarter, 18 <coughs> students who failed the Barber exam, a high number of that 18 were transfers. So they were in another school, and they transferred to the, the school in question and completed 200 hours. So they had 800 hours at a previous school and chose to go to this school probably because they could get finished in 1,000 hours. Um, that's my assumption. And so in this newer school, they were only there for the 200 hours. Well, the school that you complete a program from is what goes on your record of pass-fail rates. So they had a high number of failures for people that they had transferred in. So that it's, it's a hard thing to look at because did they not receive ac accurate education at the first school where they spent more hours? Um, and then we also have the issue of the test being memorized by a lot of schools out there and now it's not memorized anymore. Um, so we, that's another reason for some of the dip. Um, I can tell you that I looked at some schools that I'm very familiar with that are um, some of the schools that I feel do a really good job and they have pass rates in the 80s to 85s. So the schools that are, um, in my personal opinion, you know, some of our better schools in the state, are, their students are doing really well. So I think it's going to be um, an interesting process. I can tell you um, PSI came today um, to be with, with us and um, we are monitoring it closely. I met with them just Friday and their psychometricians and also with Department of Consumer Affairs just to make sure what we're seeing is what they expected as well. So they um, definitely said yes and we should be patient. And these numbers are going up. We are seeing them from day one. They are increasing about 3% all the time. So we do think we will see this turn around um, but I just want to let everybody know that we are on top of it and we are working with PSI as well as DCA to um, address this. Christy, I have a question. Um, being an industry member, uh, um, especially looking at this pass-fail rate on Spanish for the Cosmo and the Barber, regardless of the test being changed, this is a very, very high number. And I know we spoke at one of the board meetings about um, some of the students taking the class in English, but then electing to take the class in Spanish. Right. Was that something that you were able to talk to the schools about when you went there? Just, you know, giving them that, that advice about ex if they're taking this class in English and they're, and they're doing all their testing in English in the class, make sure they're taking the test in English because, I mean, you're looking at 13 passed the written and then 129 failed. Regardless of the test being changed, this number is still higher than even before we changed the test, yes. the testing. So from an industry side, to expect the numbers to go up to me is not okay. There seems like there's a curve that there's something that should have been implemented or um, something. In my opinion, it is, this isn't something that's helping the schools. It's not helping the, the licensees. Um, in an upward trend. Um, and if you've had them take the test multiple times and they're still failing, then there's a disconnect there that I think needs to be addressed. Yeah, it's, there's definitely mul people that take it multiple times and fail. I, I looked at a couple students last week that had, were on their fifth and sixth time taking the test. Not necessarily, I didn't look on, that, on those specific ones to, to see if they were Spanish or not, but there's definitely, um, candidates who are taking it multiple times. The, the exam is 
displayed in both languages. Right, we talked about it being displayed in both languages, but one of the things that we kind of discovered was they were being taught in English and then um, electing to take this test in right. Spanish. Right. When, if they were taught the information in English, as I think was Yolanda had pointed out, the translation from English to Spanish will, will differ yes. depending on the dialect that they've been. And, and I think the schools um, are aware, and the problem, you know, I, I know I've talked to one school in particular who, um, highly encourages their students not to take it in Spanish, to take it in English. Um, but at the end of the day, that, if that's, it's the student's choice what they want to do. And one of the things we did when we looked at, um, a few years back, when we looked at the Spanish, we surveyed all the Spanish students taking the test. And we said, would you take the test again in Spanish? And the majority, even though they had failed, still are taking it in Spanish. So, you know, s schools are telling their students, take it in English, but at the end of the day, that it's that student's choice what they take it in. I have a um, related question. You just mentioned um, people failing four, four or five or six times. Um, in the failed column, is that, are all five in that column, or is it just one failure? Just one. Okay, thank you. I think also when the board looked at part of this problems that, that we perceive could happen, we talked at the time of the difficulty of going through this transitional period. And could it be that this transitional period alone, trying to mix long hours with shorter hours, uh, has really thrown us a temporary curve that could be, uh, we could come out of this very quickly too? I think so. Like I said, we are seeing them Coming back up, I just this morning, um, I received the pass rates each week on a weekly basis. So I just got the pass rates for last week this morning and they were up even more. Um, I think they're gonna go up. I think it's going to um, force schools to really look at those, um, the exam content that we provide them um, and maybe look at how they're teaching. We um, have scheduled with PSI a barber workshop with schools. Um, we're having that on December 5th, I think. Um, yes. Um, so we're doing a um, hybrid town hall in Sacramento. So it, people can come into our office, people can call in. And um, Sean Condor, who's, who's in our audience, will do we, a review of we, just the barber exam. And he will actually go over the content of the exam. Um, it's what we did before we went to the exam, but we thought, let's do it again, see if we can help some of the barber schools. And, and cosmetology is low too, but we're seeing that increase quicker. What was the feedback that you got from the schools that you um, talked to in regards to this and to their uh, pass-fail rate? Like, what was their response? Are they saying that they're not um, you know, translating the material themselves or not teaching from what you guys have given them? What is the, what is, what is the I feedback? I haven't got any feedback. Terrible. No one's complained. No one, um, I have talked to schools who are doing well, um, but they're doing well, so uh, that's great. But I, I have not, we have not gotten a single complaint from any barber, any school, or barber, Cosmo, we haven't had a single complaint. Um, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Is it possible maybe, turn it on or off, is it possible that maybe Sean can give us a quick summary of what's happening to other states and they've gone through Definitely. this transitional process too so we can maybe better understand it? Definitely. You have to turn that microphone on. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Sean Condor. I'm the account manager with Cosmetology Barbering with PSI. And it's nice to be here this morning. Uh, we have been in contact with Christie's office uh, on a constant basis. We're watching these uh, exam rates. Um, as far as storms go, we're under the warning stage. We're not under the, the, the extreme stage yet. Um, and so really, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we need to watch. It's a huge concern. Uh, when you first take on a new exam to watch those pass rates. But as our second metrics and our second metric people are saying, it's, it's working just fine. 
one thing that we changed from what maybe they've seen before is the concept of the exam. And the concept of the exam went from a lot of um, different things to strictly health and public safety. And so it's a different concept that they're testing on. We're seeing that raise. They're being taught that in the schools. I'm really excited about doing this barber uh, workshop and being able to sit down with the barbers and try to figure out what's happening. I've been working on the Spanish uh, speaking issues for a lot of years to try to figure out, you know, maybe regional type translations or something that we can maybe help them because it, re it really is a concern and we want to remove that barrier if possible. So we'll continue to work on that. But one thing that we've seen in other states that our exams have been implemented in is the same thing. We've seen pass rates, uh, we'll say plummet from the, the previous pass rates and then come up about three to five percent per month. At a certain point it will accelerate because it will just kind of build on itself and, and you'll be uh, pretty much back to where you were in the, in the previous pass rates we, we anticipate. What's it, how often, what's it like to tweak an exam? I mean, do you play with the actual exam questions on a regular basis? Uh, based on how our state is doing and the hard look from your perspective? Or is, or is this something that's put out six months in advance and you can't do anything about it? The, the psychometrics uh, department, uh, test development, looks at those questions on a constant basis. And they're flagged. They pop up if a lot of people are missing them or if everybody's getting them right. So there's, there's P-vowels and, and, you know, it, it tells them how many people have 100 are passing it. There's also uh, another evaluation that they do that tells, uh, that says uh, people that are doing well in this test are failing this question. Those are the things we look at. And so it's very important uh, information that they, they feed back to us. I know that there was, uh, I believe, six questions in the Barber exam that were put on hold or you know, taken off the exam for now because they were operating in those two perimeters that just we weren't comfortable with. And so those questions have been replaced with other questions. And so on an ongoing basis, we watch those uh, and evaluate. We have a department that evaluates those and watches those and makes sure that they're performing uh, as they should be. And really, the test is performing very well in California. But when you go from a concept of you know, the, the old concepts, when I first took my test, it was all about somebody hanging over your shoulder and watching every little thing you did. And you had to hold your hands right and hold this and do that and you know put the chemicals on and, and now it's all about how you do that how you hold those shears how you you know are you are you being safe with those tools those razors and and so forth and and you know some of the barber things that we've seen uh of course it, and it's always been an issue uh in every state are barber chemicals they have a really hard time with barber chemicals and that's 18 percent of the exam so that, that's a big hit there if, they, if they're not learning their chemicals correctly. And, and that's a big health and safety risk. And so from what we see, the exam is working very well uh, with, our, with our goals. And you know, like I say, we watch those questions on a constant basis and make sure that they're evaluating what they need to be evaluating. As far as the written cons uh, questions are concerned, um, the written exams, um, are, we've talked before about grade levels. Um, are they s at a specific grade level um, for language used? Uh, 16 years old and 10th uh, grade, I believe, is what they're doing. And have we thought about lowering that? We would have to lower that in statute. Okay. Thank you. And that's about where most states are. Uh, some require GED, some require high school graduation, some, you know, something in that area, but some don't. So we, we go with that, that basis of 16 years old and 10th grade. Question for you. Um, the information that's provided to the schools, are you, is that information uh, heavily focused on health and safety, or is it just in general um, for them to help their students um, get ready and pass the test? What we do is we take the actual content outline of the examination that shows the, the, the classifications where the questions lie. Uh, maybe, you know, the health and safety or in haircutting, you know, what are those things, using your shears, those types of things. And so I'll walk through each one of them very carefully. And, you know, we obviously can't give them the questions, but we can certainly uh, kind of fuel them in that direction, especially when we see 
these, these parts like chemicals, I'll, I'll hit chemicals real heavy and, and we'll talk about the importance of them teaching that because it is 18% of the exam. So you're going to get better educated barbers uh, out of these exams if the schools listen to us and they follow that content outline. Uh, uh, Do you I, find I, that most of the schools, and I, and I'm being an industry member for a very long time, um, I realize what you're saying is that the education is on the chemicals and health and safety. A lot of these schools teach skill. A lot of these schools are really focused on the skill part of it. How do we balance knowing that, yes, health and safety is important, but where these kids, where these, where these people are coming from, it's like, like uh, Reese asked about the language. They're not coming from a, they're not coming, and not, I don't want to say this and sound like I'm dismissing health and safety because by all means I'm not. But the reality of it is that the focus is on the skill. So when I say that is, when we're looking at um, the chemical portion, these barbers are looking at barberside and cleaning their tools. Everything outside of that is really higher level than what their focus is. So when we're, when we're looking at this exam or when you're talking about the exam and you're saying that it's highly health and safety, is the terminology enough that it's meeting the level of the people that are taking the test? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I'm in firm, you know, I've, I've been a school owner. I understand how these schools operate and I understand that you have, you're the, you're the one responsible to teach these folks to be successful. And it's the state's obligation to make sure they're going to be safe while they're being, becoming successful and after they become successful. So basically what the questions refer to would be, you know, as you use your shears, you know, it wouldn't, it, it doesn't specify how the uh, haircut they have to use them or, you know, while using your shears, you know, what would be the best way to hold these when combing or uh, subsectioning or something. And, and so your questions are related to those skills, those skill sets. How would I use my shears safely? How would I use my razor safely? How would I apply chemicals safely? Keep it off the skin. Um, you know, wear gloves. Those types of things that are real basic uh, health and safety factors that they need to follow on a daily basis. Thank you. Um, Thank you. On that note, um, <clears throat> again, uh, following uh, Commissioner Fairley, the, um, the issue isn't about health and, health and safety concerns being lowered. It's more about um, people's understanding of um, the questions. So for instance, you just used the word shears. Um, that's not a common word. I mean, it's a common word in our business. Um, but it's not necessarily a common word in uh, people going to high school. Um, and so my, and, and the key isn't um, whether or not they know the word shears, the key is do they know how to use them properly. Um, and so I would just, um, I actually would like to have at our next legislative committee meeting a discussion about that statute. Thank you. Um, I had a quick, it's not so much a question, it was more, uh, prior to this, just a thought on the fail exams, uh, and I might be reframing this differently, but I feel like these numbers of going down, of pa I guess failing, might actually be a good thing in my eyes, because if we're changing an exam and we're testing on different content and people aren't passing, to me, and I'm, I'm a licensed therapist, so I've gone through the BBS, to me that signals that people are memorizing instead of learning, and so we are now, you know, we're not testing the book, or we're not teaching the test anymore. So I actually am optimistic with these numbers because it's now gonna make us, as we see the pass rate go up, okay, now we're learning public health and safety, which I think is the point of this board, right? Is consumer protection. So we're doing, I don't know, that's my thought is I, these numbers actually excite me rather than make me feel like, oh, what, what are we doing wrong, so. Okay, well, listen, let me thank you for, for answering our questions. We have a, a pretty broad agenda today, so we're probably going to have to move on. But thank you That's for fine. coming down, and thank you for uh, working with our board and our staff. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weeks. I still have some questions for Christy. Thank you. So I, I do have a concern about just what it is for students to be first in a new exam. You all, everyone's figuring out, getting you know exposure to the new test. So, I would like to know, can you just share 
How much does it cost for these students to have to retake the exams, the ones who had to go first and then essentially bombed it? Um, how soon can they retake it? And then how many locations are proctoring the, the exam? Um, there, so it's $75 fee for the re-exam. Um, they can apply right after they fail. Um, we then have to process it. So that is about four to six weeks right now. Hopefully that's gonna be a lot better because that's one of the things we appreciate about the written test only is our ability to get them through quicker. But with staffing, we have, we have um, we're at about four to six weeks right now. And your last question was? How, how many locations do they proctor the exam in? Over 20, over 20 throughout the state. So that's a lot better than when we had to do the Yes. They're getting in, once we approve their application, um, it's their choice too. So, so some students want more time and so they'll book their re-exam out a few weeks, but um, to my understanding, they're able to get in very quickly once they get approved. Thank you. And one more item on exams that I wanted to mention is something else we are doing that we've met with PSI on is we're changing our, um, our data processes to be able to provide schools with a content area of where their students are doing poorly. Um, we hope, I think we're looking for March 1st for that as well. Um, so we'll be able to have schools, will be able to go into the PSI partner site and pull up their own information and see, oh, my students are significantly performing lower in chemical services. So that's something we're hoping to have launched as well on um, March 1st. Chris is our objective for the task. We, want, we all want to pass. Right. So, but they need to pass on those, on those right. uh, I just had a quick question in regard to uh, the follow-up from the round tables that you recently had in the upcoming one? You said you didn't receive any feedback from the schools. Is it possible to maybe solicit some feedback, uh, give them an email or Definitely. a call or whatever, just Definitely. so we can get something from them? Yeah, and I think at our town at our town hall meeting that we're going to have next, we are doing the hybrid, so we're hoping to get maybe some more interaction with people. We had a lot of questions at our um, school town hall meeting, but that was specifically just for how to apply online. So I think at our next one, I hope that because it's going to be more interactive, that we'll hear some more comments as well. But we can also just reach out to schools as well. Yeah, only because if, if you didn't receive what you expected and you know that there were some that were successful, others that weren't, maybe we solicit to the ones that we know there weren't right. so we get a little bit yes. of that information that will tie into yes. um, until we get the other part done. Thank you. Thank you for your time and, and information you gave us today. Thanks for sharing the board. All right, so I'm going to move on to page number nine, which shows our licensee, licenses issued. Again, we're showing just our first quarter. Our licenses issued in the last five years. Um, we have, you can see in that last five years that fiscal year 21, 22 had this huge bump. And that's probably because 2021 was so low. We think we'll be stabling off um, with our current volume that's coming in. Obviously, COVID had a huge hit on our um, examinations. So I think we're starting to see that kind of even out. Um, and then on the next page is our license population. We're holding steady at over 600,000. And then our disciplinary review committee. Thank you to those members who have attended with us. We will be looking to schedule some um, new hearings probably in January of the coming year. All right, and next we have our enforcement report. Um, again, more staffing issues. We have a new uh, manager over our um, inspections and our site and fine unit. Um, her name is Tiffany Moore. We also stole her from the Bureau of Private Post-Secondary. <laughs> um, and then we also have some new um, analysts working in our unit. We have a new probation analyst. 
We also have a new inspector down um, here, not as far down as San Diego, but um, in our Southern California team. He'll be helping us out in the Orange County area. Um, we still have um, some vacancies in our manager positions. We have two manager positions over our enforcement team that are today both vacant, but we actually are hoping to make some announcements in the next few days on filling the, both of those positions. Um, and then we um, just moved on. We sh are showing our vacant inspector positions and what counties those are vacant in. Um, we continue to advertise for inspector positions on a regular basis. Danielle gave us some really um, good information to contact with Sacramento State. So we've been working with Department of Consumer Affairs um, HR offices and we had a meeting with Sac State on their career development team that Danielle put us in contact with um, who can't be here today because I believe she's happily getting married and um, we um, were um, so we had a great meeting with her contacts to try to get the word out maybe in some of the colleges for some of our positions um, but so far we haven't been very successful with the candidates we're receiving for these positions we're still currently also looking to change a few of our positions to a higher level um, invest special investigators, yeah. special investigator um, classification. So they would do a more extensive inspection slash investigation than what our inspectors do. Um, that has to go through a huge process through um, the, the state's um, Department of uh, Human Resources. And I believe those have gone through and we just have been tweaking some justifications and hopefully we'll hear on that soon. I hope at our next board meeting we'll have some good news on that. Um, on our next page is just our charts of the types of complaints we've received. Health and safety remains to be um, our biggest and then um, unlicensed activity, excuse me, unlicensed activity as well. And then on page 16 we go into our enforcement statistics. Um, the number of complaints received um, for the first quarters, uh, a little over 1,300. Pretty standard information, nothing too out of the ordinary on any of our enforcement statistics. I will show, um, highlight on page 18, we have added a new chart for externs. And that is, um, we thought it would be interesting to track the number of, of schools that have entered into an agreement with an establishment for externs. As we know, SB 803 increased the ability for externs to learn more hours and to also be paid. So we're seeing these um, numbers increase. We're working with our licensing committee right now on some um, potential uh, regulations that might strengthen up that program a little bit. Um, on our next page is our request for payment notices and also our payment plans. We did research um, some of the payment plans based on our last meeting and we have about a success rate of 40% on collecting of those outstanding fines. 40% of eventual collection? I believe that's right. 40% of the citations have been collected in full. What is the average time taken to uh, collect uh, something on a like, recency basis between payments? Uh, Probably every 30 days. days. It does right. range. We give them a year. We give them a year, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll move on next to our outreach update. Um, we've had some recent outreach events since our last meeting. We did our face and body meeting, um, uh, face and body skincare and nail pro show that was in San Jose. We, um, Carrie and I recently did an East Bay refugee and immigrant community consultation presentation. Um, this was done to assist um, Afghan refugees specifically on how they can get licensed, um, had they been licensed in their own country and are now a refugee in our state and a, many are cosmetologists and barbers so we wanted to assist them. We're also looking at potentially having something similar for Ukrainian ref refugees. Um, and then we did on September 25th, we did Jazz Beauty, um, Jazzy Beauty and Barber Show that was um, in Anaheim. And then we listed, excuse me, that we also did our virtual on how to apply 
um, for our examination. Um, we've done some new pub publications. We um, did a new fact sheet on home salons that was created. We did a new illegal tools flyer, and we used the, the big red circle with the line through it on our, on our illegal tools. It actually looks really good. It's later in your packet. Um, and we did a new skincare machine and device industry bulletin, updating that on some of the fat loss machines that we're seeing out in the industry. Um, we've done three email blasts um, on personal service permit, industry bulletins, and home salons. And we're continuing to um, send those monthly um, email blasts out to our interested parties and licensees. We've done a couple um, personal service permit videos um, just to make, bring awareness to the personal service permit on how and why you need that. And then also we closed out our safe sandal season um, and have a video up on our website for that. Question to on the PSPs, we seem to be having an emphasis trying to uh, promote this. Obviously, yes. why do you think we aren't successful in uh, really turning on the numbers with respect to the PSPs? Because I think um, people are working from home and um, feel they're already doing it. So why would they apply to get an, another certificate? Um, our enforcement division is looking into that as well, and we are working. We've sent several, we are, or we're going to be sending cases straight to our division of investigation for in-home um, establishments that are not doing things properly. Maybe we can promote that. Yes. <laughs> All right, the next page is our SB 803 um, implementation plan. Um, as you know, most of 803 has been implemented. We're still working on the hairstylist license. That's projected to be ready July 2023. The exam development is still going on with that one. Um, our pre-apprentice training that is going to be developed by the board is still in the process of being developed as well. Um, school curriculum, um, these numbers that we've provided on how many schools have been approved for a new um, curriculum has actually changed already. It changes on a regular basis, um, but I know we just had about four more schools get approved for a thousand hour courses. Um, almost every school now is getting close to having some form of a, of a course. Not all schools have gone to a thousand hours. We have several that have gone to 1200 hours. Um, some have gone 1,500 to cosmetology and 1,000 to barber, so it's kind of um, a, a very varies throughout all the different schools. And then the externs, we will be working on regulations for externs and hope to have that coming to the board in the next, um, if not the next meeting, the meeting after that. Um, our fines, that we were required to look at the impact of our fines. Our health and safety committee has met and we are working now to develop that language that has been looked at by our health and safety committee. So that'll go hand in hand with looking at those fines and looking at our new health and safety uh, regulations. And that is the end of my report. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. That was a lot of information we were receiving today, the good information. Let's move now to item number six on the proposed meeting dates that we would have for 2023. And what is the board's opinion on these dates? Thank you for bringing them in advance. We don't have to have a motion on this, we'll receive it back, but we, we do will not. do a, a public comment on those dates. If anyone from the public would like to comment uh, on those dates, you're welcome to comment now. And on the uh, executive officer's updates, so you can speak to both, both questions. Please come up. regarding my husband that is a barber, has been a barber for over 30 years. Um, however, he, um, we, have ha we have been having problems with his exam. So 
uh, he's Arabic speaking. He has been in the United States for the past five years. Um, speaking, understanding English, he's very reasonable, but reading the books, comprehending the questions, and um, being able to memorize that is extremely difficult for him. So, and he's not the only one. I know a lot of barbers, Arabic speaking in the Arab community, that they came here as licensed barbers or practiced barbers, and they are unable to work because of this um, hinder that they are getting with examination, understanding. I have to read the book myself personally to kind of explain that to him. But there are a lot of medical terms that I believe is not necessary. We owned barbershops. We still own barbershops in the Middle East. And my husband trained barbers. A lot of the, the businesses that we have are ran by barbers that my husband trained. But the problem is that here is not only the safety, the, you know, uh, the terms that are of course, important, and I think it's important, you know, to clean your tools and, you know, the, the, all the safety procedures. But all the questions that are asked about uh, the human body, why and how is one muscle connected to the other muscle, I don't understand, for example, what is that, the importance of that for a barber at a time that if they injured someone, injure someone. So if I injure someone as a barber or as a cosmetologist, my first reaction is to clean it, call 911, and it's not I'm going to do a procedure on, on my client. So that said, um, it has been very difficult. Uh, the second thing is that the translation. I have done a translation for him once. We have been looking for a translator for the past two years. And the problem is not only the translator, but also the fact that there is nothing in other languages than Vietnamese, uh, Taiwanese, or Mexican, uh, Spanish, or um, um, there's one more Korean. language. There's three languages, Korean. So there is absolutely nothing, no publication in different other languages. And I understand I was listening that it has to come to a point of 5% to be considered for an extra language. But so what happens to all these other people with other language, all these nationalities that are here, and the government expect them to come to the country, hit the ground, and start, start running? Still, my husband has been jobless for the past six years because he's not able to pass the exam. And he is a great barber. As I said, we had barber shops. We still have a barber shop. You know. Thank you very much. You, 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 you brought some very good points to our attention that the board members have listened to. But we're going to have to uh, move along. We're going to have okay. to put a limit on our questions today of about a two minute time frame. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, you said we can comment on the technical officer report, right? Good morning, members. Fred Jones with the Professional Beauty Federation of California. This is my tw 22nd year proudly representing the beauty and barbering industry in California. And with that experience comes some context. I'm afraid when it comes to one of the most influential tools you have at your disposal, the licensing exam. We've seen a race to the bottom over the last two decades vis-a-vis -vis the board's oversight. We used to have an aggregate score of both practical, hands-on competency and written knowledge. And for students that may struggle with written knowledge, they always had the backstop of being able to prove that they could safely operate their services in a test environment. That was always the backstop for health and safety. But it was also a key for employers. <laughs> they wanted to make sure, no matter what their book smarts are, that they could actually do a good service and do it safely. Um, so we lost aggregate scoring, I don't know, around 15 years ago. 
And now under SB 803, we've lost the practical exam altogether. So to Jacob's comment earlier, you will see a race to the bottom as students learn that all they have to do is focus on a written exam that only tests health and safety terms and competencies. Right now, students don't understand that. They do understand in the hair category that they can get out of school within a thousand hours now. And if there's one variable that's consistent in your decreased test scores, it's the hair categories, barbering and Cosmo, that have seen the drop. Not Manny's, not Scan. Why? Because in SB803, those were the only two areas that were reduced in terms of hours. So we've reduced the number of hours that they're receiving education. And you watch, students will put pressure on their instructors and schools to focus only on health and safety and nothing else. And so the unintended consequences of this effort to reduce barriers to licensure, I fear, will end up hurting clients and customers and the overall professionalism of this industry. Anyone else would like to speak to those two points? If not, then let's move to item number seven and take a look at our strategic plan. Chris, do you want to walk us through that? Sure. So in your packet is our draft strategic plan. For our newer members, um, sorry you missed out on our planning. It was, um, it was great. Um, and DCA helped us extensively with this. So we have our, um, our standard information in the front. We have a nice message from our president. And then we go into our goals. Um, I won't read them word for word, but this is um, what was developed by our board members, by staff. Um, through our strategic planning process, we've established these goals and objectives. And then what, um, what we would want the board to do today is adopt this as our strategic plan. From there on, staff will work with um, the, the DCA folks and have them help us create an action plan. And then we'll continually to report our status on these um, objectives for the board throughout our future board meetings. Is there something unusual about the state format here that we, we see a, a, a classic strategic plan but I guess I'm used to private industry where it's all followed up, also followed up with a financial plan. And we don't do that with the state no. design. to adopt the strategic plan for 2022 to 2027. I second. So we've been moved and seconded. Do we have public comment on the strategic plan? And it looks like we, we don't. So that be the case, let's have a, uh, a roll call vote for the board. All right, Steve Weeks? Yes. Callie May Pham? Yes. Megan Ellis? Yes. Tanya Fairley? Yes. Kelly Funk? Yes. Reese Isbell? Yes. Derek Matos? Yes. And Jacob Rostovsky? Yes. The motion passes. Right. Let's move to uh, item number eight on our agenda today, and uh, let's talk about the enforcement processes. All right, so these are kind of fun. Um, we gave some information to our enforcement committee and we thought it would be good to share with the board and then we also thought it would be good to share since we have especially so many new members kind of uh, um, processes of some of our big enforcement things that we do so our first one is our probation case process um, so I'm just gonna walk through this um, so a case is forwarded to the attorney generals. Keep, keep in mind that these are very high level. There's lots of stuff that goes on and under all these squares. Um, so a case is forwarded to the attorney general 
for formal discipline. And our staff in our enforcement unit are already um, planning for settlement. So they submit terms of settlement if they see fit. That's what our analysts do in enforcement. They look at the, each case and determine, you know, if it's horrible, we're gonna be like, we're not settling at all. We're going for straight revo re uh, revocation. But this is the, the analysts, what they do on a daily basis. Most of our cases, I would say, look to settle. Yes. Um, so then the DAG, which stands for um, the Deputy Attorney General, will work with the licensee to determine if that settlement is even an option. You might have a licensee that's absolutely not. I'm going to argue that my, my case the entire way, so it would go to court. So are we going to settle? If yes, then a decision is made to settle with the terms that the enforcement analyst has provided, and it's sent to you all for a mail vote. Then you, so you all read the case, you read the terms, and then you sell, send us back your mail vote decision. Staff settlement is typically probation? It is. It is, and, and it various different terms of probation. Um, and so then the pro, um, we'll assume that the board, if the board does not want, doesn't by mail vote approve that case or adopt that decision, it'll then come to you in a board meeting. I can say that this happens a lot for other boards. It does not happen a lot for us. Um, small handful of times, actually, in my entire history of being here, have we brought cases during a, an actual board meeting. Most of our cases are pretty straightforward, um, and the vote is usually you know, unanimous to adopt what the decision that was made. So the probation case is then, it, so the board adopts it, and now, now the person is going to be put on probation. So what happens is a new case is opened and it's given to our probation monitor. We have one person in our office that handles all of our probation cases. We have, I think, 133-ish cases currently on probation right now. Um, so that person then schedules an orientation with that licensee. So the, the probation monitor has a phone call with the probationer. They explain all the details of, of whatever the final decision was. Um, so they, you know, sometimes those meetings are quite extensive, um, but the probation monitor's job is to make sure that that licensee understands everything that they need to do. They may have been required for education, they may have been required um, various different things that they have to do. Usually there's a suspension involved, and so they will have to post a suspension sign at their establishment, so they make sure that that's understood, they go through all, this, all the steps with them. If there's remedial education that's determined, the probation monitor establishes that for the um, person on probation and they go through exactly what is required. Let's just say the, the reason that they got on probation in the first place was for dirty foot spas. So they're gonna look at the probation um, breakdown of education and have them take classes on foot spot cleaning. We use our prior curriculum as a guide for what is assigned to probationers for um, educational, uh, remedial education. So you might remember that our past regulations prior to SB 803, the curriculum was very specific hour by hour. So it was 20 hours of health and safety. It was you know, 100 hours in X, Y, and Z, it was very specific. So we use that as a guide for how we determine probation or um, remedial education. And so then um, the probationer ensures that all the terms are followed throughout the term of probation. They usually have to supply quarterly reports, and uh, the probationer is in usual quarterly contact with our um, person that's on probation, as well as potential regular inspections being done. Did the person fail to follow their terms? Then we're going to file a case to revoke their probation. Because if they didn't pr complete their probation or they did something that we found that violated their terms, we're going to go back to the um, attorney general and see if we can revoke that, that uh, probation. Most times they follow their probation fine and their probation is fulfilled and then they, they are off probation. So that's the probationary case process. Christy, uh -huh. uh, since you mentioned only one person is in charge of dealing with all the probation cases, does that, do we use interpreter services? We do. We, okay. And small note about the chart. 
Uh, failure to follow uh, terms. There's no yes or no on the path. Thank so you. It just looks like <laughs> it just goes, even if you fail, it goes yes, to Yes, there should be a yes <laughs> and a no. <laughs> just in case we publish this anywhere else. Okay, so the next chart is our reinstatement case process. So this is when a license was revoked. They're eligible for to ask for their license back after one year. So we, um, the individual will usually reach out to the board and they're provided a packet of petition for reinstatement. In that packet is when we recommend to bring in any letters of references, any community service documentation, any self-improvement, any remedial education they may have done, any proof of fine payments, any evidence of rehabilitation. So that's explained to them in the letter. Um, upon receipt of the petition, the case is reviewed. Is it, we determine if they're eligible for reinstatement, because often they might come in too early, so they might not be um, eligible. But if they are, we coordinate the analyst that handles that, which is also our probation analyst, handles this as well. Um, and um, that analyst will coordinate the reinstatement hearing to be held at the next board meeting. Um, most of you have been through this process. This happens during our um, board meeting. We would have the person asking for their license back in front of us. We have an attorney, administrative law judge come to these. Um, they oversee the hearing and then we have a deputy attorney general um, present the case. So it's kind of like a court event that we have. Um, and so the hearing is held in an open session with an administrative law judge and, a board, and our board members and a deputy attorney general and the petitioner. The board members make a decision in closed session. The administrative law judge then prepares that board's decision and that decision goes back to all of you to adopt. So you still have to adopt it. You still want to make sure that that judge wrote up what you actually decided in closed session. And then the petitioner is provided with that decision. So this is the one area where I think there has been some discussions over this remedial education. And what, you know, a petitioner comes in front of you asking for their license back and we tell them, did you do any remedial education? And we've never told them you should do remedial education. And the problem comes up to be that we can't tell them that. So we can't tell somebody who's been revoked to go get education because that's not within our authority. Um, and then oftentimes, if there's doing something that's not, um, if they're, say they lost their license because they were employing unlicensed activity. Well, there's no remedial education to follow the law of employing someone for, um, you know, that's licensed. So I think that is a confusion. Um, and I don't know that maybe it's something we should look at potentially with the enforcement committee in looking at should we even be recommending that they do remedial education or because we can't tell them what to do because it's not in the court order. Um, but then we're asking them after the fact, well, did you do remedial education? And the people you know, are often like, if you had told me, I would have done it. So it's kind of a catch-22. Um, yes? So in the packet, does it have a list of like recommended steps? Because you could say suggested, but I don't know if you can even do that either. So I think where the confusion comes in, and I've, we've said on these, and we've talked about this before, is then if we can't guide them, why are we, why are we making that a suggestion? So I feel like, and you know, this is a very strong point for me when it comes to this, because we're setting them up for failure, giving them this advice when we can't help them to do what we're asking them to do. So I'm feeling like we either, if we can't set a precedent of giving them the remedial education guidelines, then we need to remove that from our, um, from anything that has to do with the, the um, reinstatement process. Is there, can we rephrase it to ongoing education or something? Because that, that really goes to what we're asking for when we have these hearings is, what have you done to actually stay engaged in the industry? 
Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be remedial, but it just seems so strange. I'm reading this list, and I saw the letter that you included, and I appreciated that. It, it explains a lot about what we see in the packet. It's just things, but I realize it's things that we don't put much emphasis on when we're doing our analysis, like self-improvement of any nature or community service documentation, because we look at that and go, it's great that you've been involved in your community, but it doesn't go to the nature of why your license was revoked. And that is really the conversation that we're trying to right. have. And so it seems so strange to be, I can see how someone reading that list says, oh, well, I can do, I can get letters of recommendation. I can do community service. Though, you know, oh, I don't really have any, I can see why they don't realize that that is actually what we really focus on. Mm -hmm. and, I, and is there any way that we can hint that or make it clear that these are the things that we care about? I think my question too is that we have, if we do that, we have nowhere to point them. So, we're, so if we say to them, what kind of education? There's nothing, there's nothing on the board site that says, this is the education for what it is that you're. So if we're looking for it, we're pulling for it, looking for it, there's nowhere for them to go to get it. Realistically, there's no, there's no, there's no guideline for where they can get, that, get this information. Is there a way, one, I like the idea of removing the word remedial. Yes can continue in education or industry or, or industry specific education or anything like that. However, is there a way to put on our website some frequently asked questions? I'm going to ask for my license back soon. Definitely. And, you know, uh, you know, a frequently asked questions document that might outline these, these type of examples ahead of time so that they, anybody definitely to reinstatement could, could look up that ahead of time and plan yes. appropriately. Yes. What I, what I hear what you're saying, but again, it goes back to when they come in front of us and we ask them that question, there is no direction to be able to give them. So we're back to square one. We're back to that same, we're looking for continuous education. We're looking for them to seek knowledge, but where do they go? If we don't tell them where to go, they have no idea where to go. Right. And since we can't tell them, why are we referring it back to them? We're setting them up for failure and that's where we have to take a stand to say, either we figure out how we can do this, we as a board, I don't know if it's regulation, a, a statute, what it is, how we can do this so that we can really set these people up for success when it comes to getting their license back, or we remove ourselves from that direction because there is no direction. If, if we're looking for some type of continuing, if I come to you and say, okay, well, I, you know, my license was suspended for safety and sanitation. Well, right now we know Barberside is there. They have this course that they came up with due COVID. Well, if there's, like Chrissy said, outside of that, there's nothing else to guide them. We can't even tell them to take the barbicide exam, even though we know it's a health and safety uh, tool that's there. Most people don't know where to go and find that tool. This is, this is an ongoing uh, question, too. Perhaps we can push this some urgency to uh, develop this so we aren't developing at board meetings that are every three months. Yep, I think so. Maybe we could go there so maybe at our next board meeting the committee would have met yes. and given its recommendation. Sounds good. Well, I'm um, cold. We actually said we're going to do it. So I'm going to do it. Perfect. Okay. Oh, one last thing. Uh -huh. It's nice, especially when you're new members of the board. I wish I would have had this when I started with the board, and even now I learned something from these. So this is a really important uh, understanding of how okay. we operate in that, that very primary category. <laughs> okay, so the next chart is the inspection to citation process. And um, so we're start again, I want to stress this is very high level. A lot of stuff goes on aside from all these squares. Um, so a complaint is received. Um, is it within our jurisdiction? No, the complaint might be referred to an appropriate agency, or it could just be out of our jurisdiction completely. We notify the complaint of that. Um, but if it's yes, a case is opened and it's forwarded straight to one of our enforcement analysts. Um, the analyst looks at the complaint to determine what they need to do. And one of the, the first questions that they ask is, do I need to do an immediate inspection? Immediate inspections might not always be the case. They might need to get more information before they do that. 
So they make that decision, and if it's a yes, they um, go ahead and issue that directed right away. If it's a no, they, they do their further research. It could be obtaining different, um, more information from the, the person who complained. Um, then um, is the inspection, it goes out to the inspector, the inspection is conducted, and the results are mailed back to Sacramento. Um, if an inspection is not needed, an enforcement decision might be made right up front. Um, but we'll go ahead and go with that the inspection was done. Um, the inspection report is received in our site and fine unit, and then they review the inspection report along with all of the um, photographs that the inspector's taken. They look at the history. They determine if those violations are warranting a citation. So um, if no, there's a no violation, they, they are informed that as well. So the licensee where we did the inspection is gonna get a notice from us that no violations were found. If the inspection report um, does have violations, it's given to our site and find analysts, and then they, they actually go through and look at all the history. They take, con their considerations are made of prior offenses, if the licensee was present for those violations, and then the history of the establishment. And then after that, they issue that citation. The citation is mailed to the licensee, and that licensee has 30 days if they want to appeal that citation. If an appeal received, it then goes to our DRC unit, and then of course we have those DRC um, disciplinary review committee. Um, we have those hearings, and they can appeal their their uh, violations. If they don't appeal, that citation is final, and the payment is due. And that's a very high level of our enforcement unit. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chrissy. Let's then move on to uh, public comment. <laughs> the, the, after discussion is, do we have comment from the public? Sorry. Good morning, Wendy Cochran, licensed esthetician. I'm speaking on, this is not on. into the room, is it working now? Okay, Wendy Cochran, licensed esthetician. I'm actually speaking as myself as a licensed esthetician and not on behalf of my organization, California Aesthetic Alliance. I'd like to know what the process is for um, retaliation uh, reports for inspection. Um, I received a phone call from the board and I never got a response back from my response. Um, I was it to the board for using bad labels and dirty things and landsets and things like that. When I was in fact actually on the East Coast in Virginia Beach uh, teaching at a NASA Pro event as an educator and the report was made for an establishment that was closed down during the pandemic and I hadn't worked at in several years. Uh, the event was May 2nd. I got a call in August and I got no response. There was no closure to it. I have no idea if my name is still being out there and being under investigation because there's no circle back to this process. So if that's something that needs to be revised because I know that there's a lot of retaliation cases out on the market that probably waste the board's time, it'd be great to know what the process is of follow-up and knowing what happens after that so that we can feel confident that you guys understand that very um, particular estheticians that may be a target for these things um, actually are not out there doing illegal things. So that doesn't seem to have any sort of visible um, visibility. Um, and we know um, from the perspective of a group of 8,000 people, we know that there are a lot of retaliation cases that come through and we just never hear back. So thank you very much. There are no other speakers then. Uh, why don't we move ahead? At, at this point, is it the, would the board like to take a five minute break? <laughs> let's, let's do a five minute break. We'll meet that here in five minutes. That being the case then, uh, why don't we
we go into the, uh, uh, the discussion of the materials the board just given us, uh, item number nine. Can you have something to say on this, Christine? I do. So we, um, <laughs> we, we wanted to. We're not going to go through all of it, but we wanted to. We had given this to one of our committees, and it seemed really helpful. So we wanted to at least share it with all the board members so that you can see um, exactly the information that is sent out with um, when we send out various things. So um, it starts off with what we send out for an establishment license. Um, anytime anyone gets an establishment license, whether it's a first time li a license or a renewal, they get a copy of the consumer, um, the message to the consumer. Um, they get an, an, an owner's must know tip sheet. They get gender based discrimination policy, which is something we're required to provide them with. They get a self inspection worksheet. They get um, our most common violations that are cited during inspection and then they get the schedule of the administrative fines. Um, renewal licenses for, your, for an individual license, you get right now, as we all know, the governor waived all of our fees for two years. We're coming up on the end of that, right? Yes, sir. Um, and so we have a notice in um, four different languages that we provided um, as to the governor's relief package on that so that they got their renewals for free for two years. Um, before we move to the next, um, could I just make a comment about this one? Um, so uh, I really like the way that you did the uh, fee relief um, in the different languages. Uh, I think that's um, the way to do it, and I appreciate that. I want to go back to the one where we have the back of the owners must know this page, um, and it's it lists uh, notice to limited English individuals. And I wonder if we could change that language. Um, uh, uh, I don't know that we need that language at all, but um, as far as uh, the notice at the top, um, perhaps we could just say language notice or something like that. Um, having the words limited English individuals assumes that we're an English only state, and so I'd rather not utilize that language. Definitely. Thank you. Christy, I really appreciated the 16 most cited. I was just wondering, um, obviously, you're not going to include every language version into our packet, but um, they do come in all the different languages. Is, is that right? They do. They do. And I was wondering, is there a, a central place on the website where someone could find all of the materials in the language that they wanted? Because or would they have to hunt around and click a, a lot of different So links? all of our publications, um, correct me if I'm wrong, have, th have it all next to each other. So they're all um, connected. And then we also, I believe, have a Vietnamese and a Spanish tab Okay. so that they could just see the information in that language. Okay. And right now it is just the Spanish and Vietnamese and, and Korean. Korean. And we have some additional information. We have our health and safety regulations in Arabic. Arabic, Farsi, simplified Chinese, and traditional Chinese. So that's just our health and safety, just because we do see those as being more common, so we've had that up for quite some time. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if you scan through a few of those to the blue sheet, our next packet is our inspection materials. And this is, it just varies when oh, these Christine, are. I'm uh -huh. sorry, can I uh, interrupt? Because yes. we passed the gender-based discrimination uh -huh. one. Um, and I just wanted to see if there was a way or if it would make sense to also say trans and non-binary. Um, I know that's included in gender, but what I've seen a lot, uh, especially with my community, is we get extra discriminated against, and sometimes we'll be like, oh, that's a specific <laughs> treatment, so we're gonna charge you eight times as much, and you can't go anywhere else because no one else will take you, and I'm just worried that if that's not specifically called out, even LGBT in general, we might, you know, my community is not one to stand up for itself quite, quite often in these situations, so if we can see this, it might help um, if we have that language, it might help to prevent sure. some stuff, so. This particular form is, is not 
sort of owned by us, um, but it is through the Department of Consumer Affairs, so I'll be happy to contact them so we can get that. All right, so um, inspection materials. So we have our self-inspection worksheet, which is one of our most common and favorite handouts that we provide. Um, we have our most common violations cited during an inspection, a disinfection fact sheet, an illegal tools flyer, which you will see in this packet now has the big red symbol on it, so we wanted to make that universal. Um, and then some of these are you know, very specific. Our foot spa cleaning guides, our sample of instructions for foot spa log, where obviously um, our inspectors hand those out when needed. So um, they have a supply of these that they keep in their cars. Um, our message to the consumer, that's always handed out with inspections only because um, usually uh, people like to get a nice fresh new one. Um, our gender-based discrimination flyer, um, Department of Industrial Relations required posting. So this is um, information on labor laws um, that we hand out during inspections as well. It is something that's required for establishments to have, and it's one of those things that I, we're not required to hand it out, but we thought it was um, different that um, you're required to have it, but we weren't required to hand it out, so we just hand it out. We wanted to make sure people had it, because we there's a fine for that. We don't fine on the first offense because we're handing it to them, um, and so we, um, we have all of our inspectors currently handing that out as well. Christy, uh -huh. um, in regards to that, when these are handed out, are we instructed on where to get these, fo these um, posters at? Well, this is the document you have to have posted. This one is the one we have to have posted? It's the one with DIR at the top. Okay. So it's not all your other, I know businesses have to have a lot of other information, but this is the only one that we're required to look for. Mm -hmm. So, um, Tanya, on this um, sheet that has the attention to the establishment owners in two spots, this is that informational page that we had out. What page are you on? The attention to establishment owners, where it's got it twice on the same page. Was that on the It's right before that um, DIR page. Oh. that we give them and it tells them where to go to get those those um, flyers and then we ask to provide them with the flyer in English. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so if these are the ones that are being sent out or handed out to establishment owners and they have the links that are on there. Is it possible to uh, create a QR code instead of the link since you can't? It's not our form. Got it. So um, Can it be I suggested? don't know if DIR has a QR, but we will find out. You never know. They could already have it. Because if this is getting posted, then with the QR, you can easily scan right. with the QR rather than see a link that you have to manually type into the phone, just to make it a little simplified. OK. And then um, we also hand out information when, when needed on apprentice information. A lot of times we're at, the inspectors are asked specifically when they're in an establishment, like, hey, how can I help apprentices? So we have information, we give them on that. Um, then we have provided... We, um, for the posting issues, have we updated this to include the trafficking one that just passed? Not yet. Okay. Um, and next is our citation. We're just providing you with a sample of what our citation looks like. Um, all this red information that you see on the citation is what our analysts who are issuing a citation, they have several drop downs that kind of fit into the most common categories so that we plug in what the um, violation is and what, what needs to be done. And then next is our enforcement case correspondence material. So that's 
lots of information and the enforcement analysts will determine based on what a complaint they might see or a, you know th when they will send something out so um, it's just various different industry bulletins if we're seeing someone doing fibroblast which isn't allowed we will we will include that with our citation or with enforcement correspondence back and forth and that's it Thank you, Chrissy. I appreciate that. Um, now, uh, for the uh, next portion of our meeting, let, I want to refer it back to the individual chair persons for their, for their committees. So, in item number 10, we'll start with the Health and Safety Advisory Committee, and maybe you can tell me you can kind of uh, update us as to what happened there. Thank you. We had our meeting on October 24th. It was a great, very thoughtful, productive meeting. We discussed standardizing fine levels according to risk for consumer harm, updating regulatory language to better reflect current practices and services in the industry, and updating language to make things more clear for licensees. So if there's anything you want to add to that, Christy? Um, just that we will, staff is currently working on all of that information from that meeting, and so hopefully it'll be coming to the board, probably not in our next meeting, but soon. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate that. I know these committees are really, uh, have been in existence for some time, but now with the number of board members we're up to, we can easily staff these committees and really get a lot of our work done at, at the committee level, which is really important. Um, so let's go next to uh, Derek as far as maybe you give us an update for licensing and examination. Sure. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so our meeting was held on uh, October 10th, 2022. Uh, we went over the number of applica applications that were received, uh, applications pending, uh, candidates that were scheduled at PSI and examination pass rates. Uh, processing time, such as we touched on today too, between the six and seven weeks of the processing time, and uh, trying to get our goals met to about four weeks, to bring that down to about four weeks. Um, we talked a little bit about the high volume and the struggle that we had with the emails, which we discussed today. Um, we also discussed the Spanish language exam pass rates. Uh, Christy actually spoke with a couple of folks from out of state to see if there was some sort of uh, information that we can gather uh, from other states to help us in that quest to reduce that, that fail rate and to improve it actually. Um, that was it really. Uh, we're going to continue to review and discuss the ideas on how to improve those areas and uh, we look forward to our next meeting. Do you, do you have a date yet for the next meeting? Uh, we have not scheduled that date just yet. Yeah. It's turned into this is uh, kind of a critical thing for us. Sure, Thank no. For doing. I know it's a, a real charge. Absolutely. We also met October 10th, 2022, <coughs> excuse me, the out, um, Education Outreach Committee reviewed and discussed recent and upcoming outreach events and plans. The board created a fact sheet and home salons and updated the illegal tools flyer, which you see, um, which was in our packet. Um, and the um, we've all noticed some of the um, the uh, PSAs that are going out, so that's been really really good. TikTok and um, Facebook, so they're definitely doing a good job with um, starting to reach the masses. We also did recommend that board staff to research whether the board can require um, licensees to provide their emails and phone numbers and find ways to help improve the website. Um, explore the possibility of sending mass text messages and license to the licensees because without this information they're not going to get the information so how do we bridge that gap and the best way to bridge the gap is to collect the information up front so um, Chrissy do you have anything else to add to that? No that was great and um, it's definitely something we're continuing to work on and just on a side note we'll be reaching out with everyone to set up these committee dates for the coming year and to get Jacob's choices of his committees as well. <laughs> Thanks, honey. That was, that was good. And, and again, to all of the uh, committee chairmen, uh, feel free to contact staff, myself, whoever you want, as far as 
bringing your information from your committee directly to the board. If there's something that's, that's important to strike with, and strike quickly, let's do it. Because you're going to be doing a lot of the front work on this staff. You're going to know about it before us. Um, thanks, Arne. Anyway, now, uh, Danielle, uh, the Enforcement and Inspections Committee. So she's not here, so I can take that. <laughs> Um, so the Enforcement and Inspections Committee actually went over our site and find process flowchart, which we provided at the board today. And then the committee also discussed the possibility of offering remedial education to reduce um, or re potentially remove an, an administrative fine. So that's something that staff will be working on to bring back to the committee um, for some recommendations on moving forward with that concept. You're welcome. <laughs> Okay, let's, let's now, if there are public comment on uh, the committee meetings and uh, their subjects and agenda that they reported on, we can do that now. And, okay, so we have a Hello, Mr. President, board, and staff. My name is Peter Westbrook, and I am here representing the Riverside Community College District today. And I would just like to recognize our professionals and they are in a training program right now uh, developing pedagogical methodologies for cosmetology students and they are in labs with them and they are in the back here. Would you please Could stand you have them stand, up? please? <laughs> yeah. Thank you for coming out. And uh, besides the uh, drive down, everything's great. I really love today. You did a great job today. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And feel free to come at any time. The board is a, it's an open board. All right. If no, there's no other questions, let's move to Christy to give us a legislative update. OK. Um, so obviously, the session has ended. Um, and we just wanted to give this final uh, synopsis of, of the bills that we were tracking. So some of these are kind of the same of where we were at the last meeting, but just to kind of close it off, we'll go through these. Um, AB 646, which was a bill to talk about expunged convictions, that bill died and did not move forward. Um, AB 1601, which was a civil service, up, it's called the Upward Mobility Act of 2022. This bill was signed by the governor. One of the things that this bill did was ensure that boards have diversity on their um, boards. Um, obviously, it's going to be minimal, minimal impact to us. We think we do a pretty good job, um, not only as our board members, but it's something we strive for in our office as well. So. Um, you know, as we continue to keep adding more languages and moving forward, I think we are, I think we're one of the best, so <laughs> yeah, a little partial, but. <laughs> and the next bill is AB 1661, which was the human trafficking notice. Um, that that bill was signed as well, and the board is going to be um, providing that notice with our initial establishment licenses. Um, next is AB 1773. This was the bill that allowed us to do uh, virtual meetings, which this bill died. However, there was that um, language that got put into a, a trailer bill, so we are able to do virtual meetings up until June 30th, I believe. That does end June 30th unless something else in it is enacted. In our January meeting, we are hoping to do that meeting as a hybrid. We'll be in Sacramento. We'll, you will all be in Sacramento, but we're hoping to have the hybrid ability so that if people aren't able to get to Sacramento, they would at least be able to call in and ask questions and provide public comment. And the next bill is AB 2196. This was our cleanup bill. Um, it didn't start out as cleanup language, but the author was able and kind enough to get us a lot of our cleanup language that we needed. We still need some additional cleanup language done, so we'll be um, hopefully working this session to get some of that included. Um, and this bill, um, the implementation for this bill really goes to the implementation still of SB 803, um, some of our extra language that's really being cleaned up. So um, it's something that we've already been working on, but this bill definitely cleaned up some of our statutes. And that's it. Great. 
Let's then move to item number 15 along a similar tone, and that's uh, discussion of uh, certain proposed rulemaking proposals. So Christy, what did you come up with? So this is a little more extensive than our uh, legislative update. So our regulations update, we have been doing a lot of work on regulations. There's been a lot of meetings, a lot of um, changes. Um, we work with our um, legal counsel, Sabina, of course, and then we also work with our regulations legal counsel, Christy, who um, wasn't able to be here today, but she's given us extensive help um, on these regulation packages. So we're going to start off with our cleanup language to SB 803. Now, when you came in today, there were some forms sitting at your at your desk. This is part of that regulation package. Sabina, did you not get those? <laughs> okay. Um, so the forms are part of the regulation package because that's how regulations are done. We're going to be referencing these regulations in, um, re I'm sorry, referencing these forms in regulation. So they have to be part of the packet. So we have provided the board back um, in January of 2022 the language to SB803 cleanup. So you've seen a version of this language before, but now it's gone through the legal review and it's changed, you know, we've, we've, the regulations unit is looking at our proposed regulations to make sure that they're going to be able to get through the whole process. And that whole process is extensive. It goes through our director's office. It goes through our agency office before it even makes it to the final step of the Office of Administrative Law. And our regs unit is trying to make us as successful as possible in getting those regs to the Office of Administrative Law without any issue and not getting kicked back to us. Because everything on regulations, once we start that process, is on a timeline. So we do a lot of work up front. This is very new to us. It's been a lot more work than we've done in the past, um, but I think we have a really good product. Um, so if you go past the um, first blue sheet, you will see our regulatory language that is, you know, a lot of it is just cleanup. We're cleaning up some of the um, capitalizations. We have um, cleaned up the um, proof of training document. This was extensive cleanup because the pre-application was gone and the practical exam was gone, so that's what really um, is being all crossed out. Um, we developed a new proof of training. That is one of the additional forms that you received. We yes. Do you have a question for you. Uh -huh. There's a, a lot of changes here. Can you that kind of guide us into maybe these net changes that the board should hear about that we might perceive would be different than our intention? I, I don't believe there's any any change that is aside from any of our intention. It's very much cleanup. It's, um, you know, we had obvious major changes in SB 803, so we had to get a lot of that information that's no longer accurate out. And then what one of the, the biggest things we did was clean up those three forms that are part of your packet. And that's what took the, took the longest, believe it or not. And what we're doing is just making sure on those forms that we're asking for what is actually in regulation. So um, it's not really going to be a big change to our processing. It's not going to be a big change to the intent of what we're doing. It doesn't change anything. It's just really making sure that those forms are accurate and referenced in regulation. So basically, all staff went through 803, double cross-checked, triple-checked, making sure that everything's in the applications, making sure everything's in the regulations, or struck from the regulations. That's all you're really seeing a lot. That's why there's a lot of struck language uh, to receive. Right. Basically, it took a long time to, to cross-check all that to make sure that um, we are updating our regulations with 803 changes, and including the forms. And sometimes it's easier to make a new form rather than just edit little bits and pieces out of another form. And plus, it's really confusing to follow. So it's easier just to look at a newer form as a whole. Right. And we'll see those incorporated by reference. And everything's in line with um, nothing, uh, nothing substantive or new in here. It's right. just um, to align with the So should the board uh, want us to proceed with this? we have prepared a motion in your packet that we would need to move forward. 
and it's long. Uh, Christy, can yes. you just clarify? I see t two action needed. Um, is there are, that is for the next. I see. Okay. So we're just on the first action needed. Well, right all right now. then. I would like to move to direct staff to submit the text to the director of the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Business Consumer Affairs and Housing Agency for review. And if no adverse comments are received, authorize the executive officer to take all steps necessary to initiate the rulemaking process, make any non-substantive changes to the package, and set the matter for a hearing if requested. If no adverse comments are received during the 45-day comment period and no hearing is requested, authorize the executive officer to take all steps necessary to complete the rulemaking and adopt the proposed regulations at sections 904, 909, 931, 932, 937, and 962, and repeal sections 928, 934, 950.1, 950.2, 950.3, 950 950.4 as noticed. <laughs> I wrote it. It's written for you. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we, have, we have a second to that. I second. Okay, so the comment proposed is going to second that motion. Let's, uh, at this stage, is there public comment on the motion? Hi, Fred Jones again, Professional Beauty Federation. Sabina mentioned triple check. Here's a quadruple check. Um, which one on uh, uh, definitions? I guess it's 962E. You reference the externship vis-a-vis -vis cosmetology, but in light of 2196 passage, should it also include barbering? Oh, sorry. <laughs> it was a great comment, trust me. <laughs> Very insightful. Uh, I'm looking at uh, 962. And uh, E, paragraph E, references externship vis-a-vis -vis cosmetology only. But in light of recent statutory change, uh, i.e. AB 2196, should it also reference barbering? I think you're correct. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you very much for that. And is anyone else would like to speak to the topic? I will amend my motion to include that additional change. Perfect. Thank you. And Tanya, amend second. I amend my second. <laughs> Steve Weeks? Yes. Kelly Mayfam? Yes. Megan Ellis? Yes. Tanya Fairley? Yes. Kelly Funk? Yes. Reese Isbell? Yes. Derek Matos? Yes. And Jacob Rostovsky? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. All right, we will move on to the next item, which is, let me get back there, our transfer of credit language. So this is also included in your packet. Um, this also um, has previously been seen by the board, but through various um, corrections and review with our um, legal counsel, we have updated this language. Um, this is the um, language that allows transferring from um, either one course to another. So if you're a barber, you can transfer hours to a cosmetology or from one school to another, um, accepting those hours from another approved school. Um, and so again, the board has seen this language in the past. It has been cleaned up by our legal counsel. It is included in your packet. Um, 
And we have, again, another specific motion that we would ask the board to make. I move to rescind the board's prior July 25th, 2022 motion and approve the proposed regulatory director, <coughs> regulatory text for section 950.10. As provided in the meeting materials, direct staff to submit the text to the director of the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Business, Consumer Services, and Housing Agency for review and if no adverse comments are received, authorize the executive officer to take all steps necessary to initiate the rulemaking process, make any non-substantive changes to the package, and set the matter for a hearing if requested. If no adverse comments are received during the 45-day comment period and no hearing is requested, authorize the executive officer to take all steps necessary to complete the rulemaking process and adopt the proposed regulations at section 950.10 as noted. I second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, is there public comment on this? Uh, Wendy Cochran, California Aesthetic Alliance. Um, does this allow the schools to be able to decide that if that student that wishes to transfer or pick up a license, so say an esthetician would like to become a cosmetologist and they went to school A over here and they want to get their schooling and their secondary license as cosmetology from another school, is the school allowed to turn them down because they did not go to their school for their primary program and license? Um, we've had this situation where I have a couple of estheticians that would like to become electrologists or they would like to become a cosmetologist and they have been turned down for the transfer of these, offer, of these hours because of the fact that the schools can actually turn them down because they didn't go to Wendy Cochran School of Cosmetology. So it seems to me that if I'm taking English at Riverside Community College, and I would like to transfer those English credits for, you know, at Riverside to Palomar Community College. The, taking an English class is taking an English class. Why is this different in our industry where we're taking the programs from that are supposed to be all approved and they are supposed to be all the same content per, per statute and, and what's in the regulations as well? Why are the schools allowed to go in and turn down somebody that's already been licensed for 20 years as an esthetician to be able to come in and be able to transfer that common knowledge that they already have and they've been practicing with for 20 years into gaining another license in the industry by the schools. The schools are making these determinations. And it seems kind of counter to uh, all of the legislative stuff that we went through in 803 to lower the barrier of entry and to also pick up another license for the board. You know, you would be, you would be easily transferring credits and, and being able to be a cosmetologist. You'd be paying for your aesthetics license and a cosmetology license too. So I'm, I'm unclear as to whether this gives feedback as to whether the schools can just flat out deny them if they didn't go to their school in the first place. So. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Is there anyone else? Um, in regards to transferring license, um, again, um, I wanted to know why, well, there is a process that if someone comes with a license or some uh, proof of training and working in the industry, they are able to transfer their, um, their license to a California license from any state and also from outside the United States. But I want to know, uh, there is, why if there is a hurdle of just transferring that license and experience to a license, to 
California license without doing the exam. The written exam, which is very difficult. And if there's a possibility that is handled on a case basis on each individual, that if that person can be tested and not a cookie cutter law being applied to every single person in different situations. So um, that is actually what I wanted to know. And I want to know how it can be handled, how uh, consumers or students or people who want to work in the industry and have the experience are able to actually go over that hurdle of going through these exams and studying and trying to find you know, translators and all that and just getting the exam tested for what they know and start working. All right, thank you. Unfortunately, our rules preclude us from having an uh, answer to questions here. But certainly, you could uh, contact staff by email. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Remember where we are in the meeting? <laughs> Let's call a vote on the resolution then. Steve Weeks? Yes. Kelly May Pham? Yes. Megan Ellis? Yes. Tanya Fairley? Yes. Kelly Funk? Yes. Reese Isbell? Yes. Derek Matos? No. And Jacob Rostovsky? Yes. The motion passes. All right. Let me get back to my items. Next, we have an update for our instructional materials. This is something that um, we have approved in the past. We wanted to let you know that we actually finally have our instructional material language approved and finalized. It was adopted by OAL. This is um, explaining in regulations the requirement that uh, schools must have a um, textbook. Um, and that will go into effect January 1. We'll be sending out notices to schools. They, uh huh, go ahead. Do, do we need a, a vote on this? No. No. Will it be coming back to the board? No. It's done. Done deal. <laughs> um, the next item that we have is a discussion for our disciplinary review committee. This board um, yeah. talked about the disciplinary review committee back in 2020. So <laughs> some of you weren't here. Um, but so for the sake of some of our newer members, we have a disciplinary review committee which at times has met monthly for three days a month. Um, right now we're not really doing it monthly because really because of COVID, because there was such a drop in so many citations, but it's an informal process in front of three of our board members who serve on that committee to um, have somebody come in and appeal their citation. We had struggled in the past about, um, it's a lot of time taken out of people's day that um, they have to come sit with us for three days um, to hear these hearings. So we were kind of having difficulties back in maybe 2019 um, on um, getting members to be um, available for those committee hearings. We, um, at that time, we looked and that the, the, it's the regulations that state that it must be board members. The statute would allow us to have non-board members appointed as DRC committee members. Um, we have not had those issues in some time uh, ever um, since, since then. I mean, and we're, we've increased quite a bit. And I think most of you know that we're pretty flexible from the staff point. If um, Megan can make it one day, we take her. And if Tanya can make it another day, we'll take her. So, and, and everybody's been, you know, super, super helpful on all of our disciplinary review committees. And it would be, um, a, I pose the, the question to the board is if we really wanted to move forward with these regulations or if we are fine to stay as is with our board members serving on the DRC. I say board members only. <laughs> Absolutely opposed. I think that we, because of the process of being a part of the DRC, the information that we receive is very important that we keep that in line with that, opening up to the public and create and I'm going to just leave it there. <laughs> yeah, and um, uh, noting that this was uh, June of 2020, a lot has changed, including a number of us coming on the board. So um, if we were to do that, I'd want to revisit it anyway. So I'd prefer it just be board members. Thank you.
dealing with a uh, nine-person board that at one time was staffed with was, was only six yes. board members. And it was uh, a yes. little frightening back there having to delay. We don't want to delay people's hearings. That's not fair right. to them, but it's just a lot of work there. I think it, once we're at, once we are where we are right now, and certainly a 14-member board, it should be very easy for us to do this. And I, I encourage all new board members to get involved in that. Well, nothing will teach you the regulations better than sitting through one of those uh, DRC. <laughs> they are, uh, you, you'll learn very, very quickly. So. Do we have another DRC planned for the South soon? We don't have one planned yet, but we will be looking at getting one planned here. Um, we'll be reaching out probably for the south we have more hearings down here but we also need to do one in sacramento as well but i mean would that be this year or are we talking next we're talking year next year okay we try not to do too many in uh november december around the holidays sure i just noticed we had a lot in the south so yes yeah. do you need a formal motion to change that sabina do you think we need a Right. We were. We have, we haven't even gotten. To the point. That's true. Right. Yes. We haven't even gotten it. anything to bring to you. It's just a discussion. It is like you dropped. Right. It's <laughs> one thing off my list. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, and then the last item for this is just um, a couple quick updates. The apprenticeship regulation package is being worked on. It's our next big package that we're working on now that we've got the SB 803 cleanup through the process. Um, we've already started working with legal on the apprentice, um, but it's a big package. We're hoping to have that to you at the next board meeting. Um, it will be extensive. Um, I don't want to, I'll just warn you ahead of time. It's an extensive reg package um, where we're really trying to strengthen that program and, and improve, improve the apprentice program. Should we go through the committee first on that? It's already been through the board. So we're at the right level, I believe. But the board could always make a motion at the next meeting when you see this to send it back to committee if, the, if that's what you feel needs to happen, if there's more discussion that needs. You never know. Um, externs, as we talked about as well, um, we are working on that now. Um, luckily, we have that new uh, regulations analyst, so hopefully these things will move faster than what they have been. Um, and then um, lastly is our disciplinary guidelines is something that we have to update, and we haven't quite started that, but we have had our initial conversations with our regulations legal counsel to get those moving. And that is it. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. Let's move to item number 16, which is public comments on any items that were not on the agenda. So, uh, again, I'll remind you that the board cannot discuss any public comments, but are there any comments that you would like to make? Do a few of you uh, uh, people out there at, from the junior college, are you um, would you like to reserve a spot on the board for when you've been uh, a few years in the business? Maybe we can take that reservation from you right now. All right. Okay, it looks like there's no public comments. Now, uh, suggestion to the uh, board members for any future agenda items. I have one. Hello, everybody. Um, as a practicing esthetician of 18 years, I would like to, and, and I have the privilege of working with uh, newly licensed estheticians and mentoring them, um, I'd like to propose some changes in extraction training in school, um, in schools. I have, I have a suggested model um, utilizing cotton-tipped wood applicators, disposable, super effective, minimal damage on the tissue. Um, I end up retraining estheticians with these cotton tip wood applicators as opposed to what they use now is your fingers, gloved finger in, in school. Um, and so, and we have so much more success. And so I'm looking forward to, to presenting and discussing that as a school um, adjustment. Let's put it on. And would everybody like one to take home? <laughs> <laughs> I brought enough for everyone. Put it in your... Not a COVID test. <laughs> now, 
Little tip, they do need to be wet with water before using them on the skin. <laughs> I would like to definitely discuss, and I'm sure Chrissy's going to um, include it, another update on the PSI testing um, and the Spanish fail rates, um, and just kind of honing in. I know the um, Education Committee, um, hopefully it would have met by then, but honing in on what this is really looking like um, is concerning, um, but not, um, not taking a back seat to the language and making sure that it is um, that we're discussing the language and how this test is affecting um, the industry in the whole. Um, I would like to add a conversation around accessibility and affordability of education, training, and requirements. Um, I know especially within lower socioeconomic communities, I'm sure a lot of these citations and violations around at-home practices and unlicensed practice is because they can't afford to go to school and become licensed um, or to do unpaid you know, internships in order to get hours. So I love to just start discussing how we can make this a uh, more affordable career and also safer, right? Because if we're licensed, then we're practicing things a lot safer. So that is my suggestion. report on some information. Great. Any other suggestions? Okay, at, um, since we've done this, the next item is for the uh, board to go into closed session on a um, uh, HR matter. Perhaps now we can take a half hour lunch.